everybody. Um, welcome to uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, let me just make sure this is all working. Perfect. Okay, so welcome to the TESOL Research Professional Council webinar in December 2020. Uh, my name is Scott Douglas, and I'm the chair of the TESOL Research Professional Council. And I just want to say to everybody, uh, Kulimp Pachyap. So Kulimp Pachyap means welcome in Insilixchen. And Insilixchen is the language of the Seelks Okanagan Nation. And that's where I live here in British Columbia, and then I work here as well. And so uh, a little bit about the professional uh, council, the Research Professional Council. We're a group of 12 TESOL members some of whom are in the audience right now. And we work together to advance English as an additional language teaching and learning through research. So this webinar is part of those activities that we do each year. And so we're very lucky today to have um, Ursula Stickler, who's gonna be talking for us. And she's gonna be talking about why we need to know what we know, uh, epistemology for online language teachers. So some of the things um, she's going to be looking at today is making meaning in an additional language online, helping our learners comprehend during online tutorials, and um, thinking about additional language learning tasks online. So I, I'm very excited to, to hear this webinar. Um, uh, Ursula Stickler, she's a senior lecturer in the School of Languages and Applied Linguistics at the Open University in the United Kingdom, where she teaches German and, and research methods. And she's done all sorts of work in syn synchronous language learning and teaching online. And she uses research methods such as eye tracking to look at how online learners and teachers establish attention online together. So um, everybody, if you'd like to welcome uh, Ursula, I'd like to clap our hands. Yay, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much, Scott, for this lovely introduction. And, and thank you for welcoming me to your group. So. Uh, I, I've seen in the text chat just a, a little bit of where people are um, joining from, so you won't be a, a surprised that we've got all different time zones here. Some people might be yawning already, and for some it might be early in the morning. So hello to everyone around the world, <laughs> and I'm glad to join you from Austria today. So not far away from the Czech Republic, but very far away from where the, the hosts are sitting at the moment. So Scott has already talked about my own background. So I teach at the Open University, which is a fully distance teaching institution. So we, we teach students who are not on campus, apart from a very few PhD students who are allowed to actually come to Milton Keynes to the campus of the Open University. The rest of the students is basically all over Great Britain and all over the world as well. And we teach them by um, webinars, by uh, Adobe Connect, by using different means, but also by preparing materials for them. What I want to talk about today is linked to this kind of, of teaching. It's, it's linked to um, a teaching that has to do with without direct presence in, in a classroom. And during the past few months, many more of us have experienced this online teaching, teaching through webinars, uh, through video conferencing, and through distance teaching modes. So let me start. To me, Scott, if you could let me soon as see the PowerPoint. Um, uh, I think you are a co-host. Are you able to, to share your screen? I should be able to share my screen. Oops, I think we lost you. Oh no, there you are. Oh, you're muted, uh, Ursula. Okay, fine. Am I unmuted? Yes. Got yes, okay. 
Tell me as soon as you can see my, my uh, screens, my PowerPoint. Can you see the, the slides? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, the slideshow. Anything now? No. Share screen. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, it won't let me share my screen. Oh no. Um. Allow Zoom to share your screen. Yeah, because I have you listed as the host. Okay. Oh dear, so I have to quit and come back in if it um, before it allows me to share my screen because you've ah. upgraded me in between. So bye bye for now. I'll come back soon. <laughs> All right. Well, I will entertain everyone with a. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you. <laughs> All right, everybody, sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, maybe while we're waiting for Ursula to come back, folks can uh, continue to introduce themselves in the chat room and we can say where we're from and uh, what we're looking forward to uh, in this webinar. And I will start. All right, I, I see um, Ursula is just driving. Here we go. Welcome back, Ursula. Sorry, folks, about the technical difficulties. Um, just what we are trying to show about online teaching, isn't it? Now, let me try to share my screen again and see if I can. Oh, if, can I'll just I... let me make you a co-host. And yes, it's working. Ah, perfect. 
that's the intricacies of uh, Zoom. Uh, as I was talking to, to Tiffany before, to, to our uh, co-host as well, is that I, I switch in between all different kinds of applications for online teaching. So for the university, we're using Microsoft Teams or Adobe Connect. I also use Skype privately and um, a little tool called Jitsi sometimes for meetings. So working in between all those different tools obviously does doesn't do me any good because sometimes I forget how to switch things and sometimes the permissions are not the same. So I, I can do things in one tool, but not in the other. So let me just introduce you then to the overview of, of what I'm trying to talk to you about uh, for, for the rest of, of the next 60 to 90 minutes. Um, as, as Scott already said, we want to talk about epistemology. So the things, how we know things that we think that we know. Um, the first starting point, of course, is talking about and thinking about what we know. And because this is not just a lecture, it's not me talking to you, I will ask you to participate in, in certain ways throughout the whole talk. So I will ask you for your feedback, for your input, for your comments and so on. And at any time, if you want to, uh, to ask a question or say something, uh, please use the text chat or raise your hand. And if I can see your camera or uh, I can see that you want to, to say something, I'll uh, give you permission to speak and, and you can join in by asking questions as well. So we'll discuss what we know, all of us, what we know, uh, talk about teaching as a special form of, of communication. Um, look at the student side as well, to look at what learning is and how uh, students learn, particularly online, and at the, at the problems and uh, also benefits of online language teaching. Some of the challenges and I'll go through some of the practical tips as well. So let's start with what we know. Um, or rather, I'll ask you, what do you know? And I'll ask you to, to write in the text chat or use one of the tools I, I sometimes use for, for presentations, which is called Tricider, um, to type in the Tricider one sentence about something that you know. And by knowing, I mean, it's not an assumption, it's not a, a belief or a thought, not something that could be true or not true, but something that you um, think is a secure, very firm knowledge in just one sentence. So not more than a few words, just write down one sentence of uh, what you know. Using the Tricider, it, that's an online tool that allows discussion, it allows question and answers, but also comments and ratings. So it's an online tool that's used for, for language teaching or other, other forms of teaching as well. And it um, allows you to start a debate online, basically. So you can use the Tricider or you can use the, the text chat um, as well. Let me just see if I can look at the chat at the same time and see what you believe that you know. So just a few. Yep, I've got <laughs> I've got a few lovely examples here as well. I'm I'm checking my other screen to see if anybody has responded on Tricider because I like the tool and I think it's very very useful if you're, if you're trying out different tools, if you're getting used to online teaching and just always get into a variety of tools because if one thing doesn't work, you can always use another one. And TriSight is something that you can use synchronously and also asynchronously. <laughs> okay, I've got some lovely comments here, some sentences that people know. Things like I love chocolate, definitely that I can I can share. Please, yep. I know that knowledge is situated. My coffee is hot. Yep. Lots of lovely statements. That's just the kind of, of sentences that I was looking for. I know that I live in Arizona. Congratulations to you. I know that teaching efficiency is a critical condition of the teaching process. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So 
<laughs> Let me go back to my slides and give you also a few examples of um, sentences that other students have given me before. So this, this is what I've prepared earlier as we do in teaching. Um, in case you haven't given me any sentences whatsoever, I've prepared a few sentences here that show the different kinds of knowledge. But actually in the text chat, you already covered all of these different types. I know that I love my daughter. I know that I love chocolate, love my daughter. This kind of, of knowledge, of firm, uh, secure knowledge. I know that spring follows winter, or I know that things fall down because of gravity. Slightly more surprising statements, like I know that pink is not a color. I know that I speak English. I know that I live in Arizona. So these are all different statements about knowledge, about things that you believe that you know. Now that seems to be an easy question. Everybody can answer that really quickly. So the next question I hope is a little bit more dif difficult. How do you know? How do you make this decision? And link to that, of course, it what is knowledge? If you make the decision, this is firm knowledge, I know this for, for sure. How did you make the decision? Reflect back on what you did to decide this is knowledge or this is a sentence that I want to share with others as well. That's the different uh, approaches you have. So how do you know? Or in other ways, in other words, um, epistemology. This is the discussion in philosophy, we call that epistemology. How do we know? Um, link to that is what is knowledge, but also do we know the same thing? If you think about the different examples that were given in, in the text chat that were shared here or shared um, with me with the students in a, in a different seminar, uh, all these sentences have a different quality, don't they? You wouldn't compare, I know that I love my daughter, I know that I love chocolate, with things like, I know that things fall down because of gravity. So that's a different quality. But there's also a difference in how we communicate what we know. Most of you used the phrase, I know that, to introduce the sentence. But you can also say, it is absolutely true. It, there's no doubt about that, or this is fact. Things like that you can use to ensure that other people realize this is a knowledge. This is something you believe very, very firmly. Now, of course, as language teachers, we always put this into question. We have knowledge in our own language, but we not necessarily share this knowledge in the other language that we teach. So if you if you are a native speaker of English, of Indo-European languages, for example, you would look towards the future as something in front of you. You use metaphors like leaving the past behind, let's look together towards a brighter future. Metaphors that indicate that the future is before you and the past is behind you. If you're a Chinese native speaker, your metaphors, your language is structured to tell you that the future is actually behind you. And in a way it's logical because you don't know what the future looks like and things that come up from behind are surprising, are new, are those things that you don't know about. So you have no, no idea what the future looks like. And if you don't know what it looks like, it might well be behind you. So different languages transport different ideas of knowledge and also different metaphors that show you how you, um, how you communicate this knowledge. Now let's go back to the, um, the philosophical terms, epistemology, the way how we know, thinking about how we know, that is, that is epistemology. And if you think about the sources of knowledge that you used, uh, some of them are your senses, for example, pink, it's a color, I can see that pink is a color, or um, I like chocolate, I like the taste of chocolate. Others, um, other sources of knowledge are rules, for example, this is a grammatically correct sentence, but also that's not allowed to do here, there's a law about this, you're not allowed to do this. So that, that's a source of knowledge and you know that, you, you can confirm that. Uh, sometimes the source of knowledge are other people. 
but what we're teaching, if we're teaching languages, is also some kind of criticality. Question the sources of your knowledge, question whether that is always the case, whether that is the case in the other language as well. So if, if you're learning Chinese as a native speaker of Indo-European language, question whether you're just using a metaphor when you're saying, I'm looking forward to the future, or whether this is something that's a universal truth and knowledge that's shared universally amongst all humans. So we're teaching criticality, we're teaching comparing different worldviews, as well as just teaching languages and the metaphors and, and the structures they imply. You also think about the justification of knowledge. Um, are you referring to authority? Are you referring to tradition? Or are you using some kind of measurement to justify that what you're saying is not just a rumor or not, your, not just your feeling, like I know that I love my daughter. It is some truth that the other people have to believe as well. Some authority, um, like the accusative case in German, brilliant. A brilliant example of authority because we, we don't explain why it is like that. You just have to form the, uh, the, the uh, accusative case now and you have to use the accusative case in this sentence. So you're referring to tradition, to authority, to usage maybe as well. But once we're teaching, we might be asked as well, whose authority? Why do you believe that, for example, British accent has to be taught and not the Australian accent? Why do you teach this kind of language and not another kind of language? Why do you not teach street language rather than um, academic English, for example? Also, once, you free, once you're referring to authority, you have to justify how new knowledge is created because authority is something that's, um, that comes from the past. So if, if you always only rely on authority, you will never be able to justify new knowledge, the creation of new knowledge. You refer to the old books, the written text, something that's been used for years and years and years. So how do you ever create new knowledge or new language? You also think in language teaching about sharing this knowledge. So epistemology, thinking about how we know, doesn't stop there. As teachers, we share this knowledge. And who has the right to know who do we teach our knowledge, for example. And how do we teach this knowledge? How do we communicate our knowledge? Are we the authorities? Are we the, the people in the know and just transmit knowledge that we have? Or do we attempt to create a shared understanding? Do we negotiate with our students what the correct way of saying or the best way of saying or the most creative way of saying something is? So this kind of epistemology links teaching to philosophical ideas ideas about reality and about knowledge. And just to give you a few more philosophical terms for, for what we're talking about when we're talking epistemology for teachers, um, these are three different conceptual frameworks that explain how the world is and how we know and how we share this, this knowledge. Uh, in positivism, very crudely put, people believe that the world is. It's the, the most mm, basic understanding of physics, for example. A, a physicist will just measure the world, will look at it, will uh, weigh it, will uh, measure the length and, and so on, and count and describe what is out there. They will not question that, for, for example, the Earth is round or Arizona is a state of the United States. You, you won't question these things. You just count and uh, measure them more and more precisely. And by doing it ever better and ever more precise, you can produce more or less objective knowledge. You don't interfere in the measurement, you just take your distance from that. The other ways of um, other frameworks, other, other ways of accessing knowledge and accessing the world, for example, phenomenology, where you, you do believe that there is a physical world out there and we can know it and we, we can explain the phenomena we, we encounter, but there's also a social world and the social world exists of humans interacting with each other and understanding these humans interacting with each other takes different kinds of uh, research, the different kinds of questions and different kinds of approaches than just measuring and counting and describing. 
So under, achieving more or less good understanding is based on empathy as well as on uh, talking to people and interacting with other humans. And then there is the, the form of uh, the, the framework that takes materialism as a basis, where you view the world as intertwined. The material side and the social world are totally intertwined. And by observing, for example, material um, or physical objects, you're already changing it. Your observation already changes what you can see. So explaining, um, explaining phenomena, for example, is already a uh, political engagement. You're already making a statement that potentially changes the world. Saying that you would believe that there is no objective, no innocent knowledge, because everything that you do influences how the world will be in the future. This, this is um, a framework that's at the basis, for example, of action research. If you're doing action research, then you're engaging with your own environment in order to change it, in order to influence it. So you're not, not even believing that you can just distance yourself from your classroom and observe it very objectively. On the contrary, you're engaging because you found a problem, you found an interesting question here, and that's why you're um, trying to change something and to work with others in engaging in this uh, situation. Okay, so there are different ways of knowing. We've already established that I love chocolate is not the same kind of knowing than uh, I know that the earth is round or I know that gravity makes things fall down. Um, and this kind of realism saying I need to measure and I need to, to count to be able and to distance myself is only one way of, of knowing and it's not the only way. You, you can approach uh, reality, for example, by skepticism by questioning everything that's, that uh, anybody says. You just say, I can't know anything. We live as if we do um, because it's just pragmatic, but knowledge is not something that really exists. You can always ask a question about it or doubt statements that other people make. You can also take the, the road down of relativism and say what, what you know is directly related to who you are. So the way you're approaching the question already influences any potential answer. So you, you have to take yourself as a person, as a knower, into account. Radical constructivism takes this approach that we actually actively construct our knowledge. Our knowledge is the way that we explain, that we see, that we talk about the world. And by talking about the world, we're making it this in this way. And in social constructivism, this interaction, the communication is a very relevant, very important part of this shared creation of knowledge, this knowledge building together. Okay, now why am I talking about all this epistemology, uh, epistemology and the ways of knowing? Because teaching is this special form of communication, where in some ways you have to communicate knowledge from one person to another. But the way that you do it can be very different, depending on what you believe, what your ontology and your epistemology are. So you might not uh, talk about it all the time, you might not um, reflect on it all the time, but your epistemology, your way of believing influences the way that you teach as well. Now one way of, of uh, explaining teaching is teaching is a direction of attention. You can't teach everything at the same time to, to uh, all your students. So you're, you're focusing their attention on particular aspects of the language, for example. You're, you can use gesture, like in this image, you use your, um, your index finger to point to a certain thing in the room. You can also use whiteboards, props, realia, you use tasks, uh, use whatever you can in direction, uh, directing attention to a particular part of the language to teach this aspect of the language. But we're talking about online teaching. So focus for just one minute on the difference of online communication 
what is different if you're communicating online? I just showed you this, this index finger pointing at something. Now you can probably see my index finger pointing, but you can't see like in the image what I'm pointing at. In a physical classroom, you would be able to see that I'm pointing into the corner here, or I could point at a, at a window or at a, at a picture. Um, but online, there is a difference in the way I can uh, direct attention. There's a difference in, in the way I can communicate with my students in, in the classroom. So when you're teaching online, what is different? Please use yet another tool that I like using, a Padlet, to give me some answers to that. So that the uh, short um, URL to the Padlet is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash padlet.com. That's an online tool, padlet.com uh, forward slash U underscore stickler forward slash TSOL 8 D, D E C for December, 8 December. And I think Scott managed to put the, um, the URL in the text chat last time. So that would be really lovely if you could do that again. You can, of course, use the text chat to give me answers to this question as well. But if you use the Padlet, I can um, look at it on my other screen at the same time and see if you, if you actually just practice using a different tool or find out what, what a Padlet looks like. That might be interesting as well. Let me just refresh my screen here and see. Oh, yes, I can see some answers on the Padlet. Thank you very much for that. Now, let me also check, uh, check in, the, in the text chat and see if there's anyone writing about uh, online teaching. <laughs> Yes, nonverbal communication is lacking. Okay. Um, what is different in online communication? The opportunity for miscommunication, definitely, yes. No sense of place. Um, you've got a different place to the, the other people. You're not sharing a physical room. So you've, you've got a sense of where you are, but you have no idea of where other people are. That's why I like asking people at the beginning of, a, of an online seminar, where are you at the moment? And some people say, in my kitchen. And others say, in uh, Peru, in Lima, in Argentina, and so on. Online, you can't move around the classroom and speak momentarily to students one-to-one, -one, but you might be able to send a private message. Exactly, that's already this, uh, yeah. This, this works, but there's an alternative. Okay. Learning about class participants is necessary to teaching, definitely. Yeah. This association, this location, yeah. We have to teach technology use in addition to language. Don't we just, particularly over the past months, I, I think we could all um, gain a lot of experience in teaching online or in training other people to teach online if you already knew how to do that particularly. There's a voice lag, sometimes there's a voice lag, yeah. A session could last around an hour, an hour 15 or more. We lose participants' attention, definitely. So yeah, mute, unmute. The preparation, okay, there's somebody still writing, so I'll leave them to finish that interaction. Teacher and student present changes a lot. The teacher has to use more facial expressions and adjust his or her voice projection to project a good image on the screen. It's good to know, to try it out beforehand, and it's good to know what, what your voice sounds like um, if you're using a new tool, for example, because even if you're using uh, the same computer, your voice might sound different if you're using a new, uh, a new tool. Harder to break down. Effective filter, yeah, and interruptions from others in the home. I, sorry, that reminds me of all those, those funny uh, video clips where you, you see a news reporter and then the, uh, the child comes in or a cat uh, runs across the room and, and so on. Always lovely and distracting, but this is what happens in real life. Yeah, so we've got lots and lots of ideas about the different difference in online communication. So apologies for connectivity issues, interruptions from others. Yep, all of it. Apologies, I'm going to close the text chat now again so you can see the, the screen and um, PowerPoint slides again.
this is just one of the examples of, of a teaching tool, an online teaching tool that we use. It's Adobe Connect, and I've, I've uh, just labeled a few of the, of the elements of it. There's a microphone, the emoticons, there's a video image, text chat like in Zoom, and there's a whiteboard or a content board where you can share some, some content. You also have a, a list of participants. And in Zoom, that works slightly differently because some, some people are present as video images and others are, are just present as, as names. And in, um, in Adobe Connect, for example, as a host, you can decide who is, who is showing the video and who isn't showing the, the video. Right, so these, these are, um, this is just the interface of one of these um, teaching tools, online teaching tools. And many people start by looking at online teaching with a deficiency view. So you, you're looking at things and focus on all the things that you cannot do online. So some of you mentioned in, in the Padlet as well, a lack of physical presence, a lack of visual cues, for example. You, you might have some um, facial expressions if the teacher uses the, the video camera, but if not, you might miss a pointing finger. You might miss, um, even if the teacher points, you miss what they're pointing at. There's also a lack of immediacy. I think that what uh, somebody referred to as a difficulty to breaking down the effective filter. There might be a lack of feedback or a lag in feedback. So you might have to wait a little bit longer to get, get a response. And some people think that online teaching lacks personality. Now, from one of our studies, let me just show one example of a of an inexperienced online teacher and her uh, interaction for a very short tutorial, just, just a section of a tutorial about 10 minutes long, where she is looking all over the screen for things that she could do. She's looking for to, to make up for the deficiency of the online uh, space. And when we asked her in a reflective interview, how do you compare online teaching to your normal classroom teaching or she permanently reflected back on things that were missing the lack of um, of uh, feedback from the students the lack of, of immediate pointing of, of uh, showing students where they should look at the lack of a facial um, facial expression that could tell her that they have understood that just this all these things that, that she was missing and she made a lot of comparisons between um, face, face teaching, so classroom teaching, the normal classroom, and this online tutorial. As I said, this was, was a, a fairly inexperienced, a, a very inexperienced online teacher. So a lot of, of this deficiency view of online teaching. But of course, there's an alternative as well. Some of you already brought in this, but you can do that, but you can do something else. So you might not be able to do this, but you can do something else. So there's an, an other way of looking at online interfaces. And if you look at this now and particularly focus on, but what can you do? What, what is possible to do in an online room? Just give yourself a minute and come up maybe with some, some positive things, some ideas that can help all these deficiency views, all these deficiencies that you've listed before. Okay, feel free to write in the chat or write in the Padlet or just think about it. It doesn't, doesn't matter whether you write it down or not. Okay, well, one of the things I've already noticed if I don't give specific instructions right here now, <laughs> it's much more difficult to get the feedback, isn't it? Much more difficult to rely on the spontaneous interaction. In a physical classroom, I, I look at you, or I just so, sort of point to, to the paper and you know immediately what I expect you to do. Okay, so much easier to share resources with students instantaneously. Students can work at their own pace when it's Asynchronous, absolutely. Breakout sessions, group rooms, yeah. Text chat, tool for questions and comments. Students don't have to interrupt the class and the teacher. Absolutely, annotate, show examples, even show corrections. 
that's it. That's exactly the kind of alternative perspective that I was looking for. You've got the same interface, you've got the same tool, you've probably got the same students, but instead of a deficiency view, you've got a difference view. You make use of the online affordances, for example, the multiple modes for reinforcement or confirmation, the multiple modes that um, if, you, if you want to say to a student, well done, you don't just use your voice, you don't just use your smile, you can use different modes at the same time. As somebody mentioned, it's adaptable in the pace for different skills levels. You can also deliberately use visuals and case directing. So you point the students to some um, element of the language, you can prepare material that focuses them on some element that you want them uh, to focus on. And also students can use feedback in text, in voice, using icons, emoticons, and this is very useful for shy learners. It is, it's helpful for people to hide in the online space as they could never ever hide in a physical um, classroom. And just to confirm that, let me show you um, an image from another eye tracking study. And this is a very experienced language tutor. And you can already see the way that she has used this online space, that she has prepared the online space in a different way. Um, th this is not the gaze tracker that tracks all the, all the movements of her eyes, but this is a, a heat map that shows where the main focus of her attention lies during this, um, this tutorial. The way she prepared the, the screen is different. So she has images there. She also uses a pointer, this little hand at the bottom pointing towards the Steilküste, so the cliff. Uh, she also has the red dots indicate a lot of attention. She has a lot of attention on the participants window. So this is where the, the names of her participants are listed. This is where the participants show emotion, show emoticons, show a hand raised if they want to say something, um, but also the, there's the, the ability to speak and the microphone, the active microphone shows that they are interacting or trying to speak. So there's a different use of the online space. And when, when, you, um, when we talk to this teacher afterwards, there's a lot of, um, of knowledge about how she can compensate, cope, and also use the, the online space in a different and maybe even better way. Um, if you use Microsoft Teams, for example, you can use uh, closed captioning. You can ask students to make it easier for themselves to follow your voice by actually having direct transcription of what you're saying. In an online space, you can use easy reading software, for example, that annotates difficult words or you can use all sorts of, of online tools, online um, dictionaries to aid the students. And to show you that this difference actually makes a huge difference, here is the, the comparison of these two teachers, the experienced teacher and, wait for it, the inexperienced teacher, and the places they focus their attention on. So the, experience in, in this case we divided the tutorial into three phases the first is introduction so that that's in a physical classroom this would be uh, you open the classroom door you let the students come in you wait until they settle down you say hello to everyone you check that they're physically well you check that they're all there they've got their stuff ready and, and so on in the online classroom it might be something like um, can you hear me so a sound check an audio check uh, making sure that the connection is stable. You can see sometimes indications of connectivity issues, but also saying welcome, hello, and um, greeting your students. So that's the introductions. Then there's the teaching content, however long that, that is. It's the uh, when, when you focus on, on the language uh, that you want to teach. And the final, the same as in, in every physical classroom, the farewell saying, saying goodbye to your students, waiting until everybody has left the classroom tidying up the whiteboard and so on, and then uh, going as, as well, so closing the tutorial down. And in these three phases, the very experienced teacher was focusing very, very much on the social side of interaction. So the hello, the well-being, um, the, the chit-chat, 
um, of the, the with the students and not on, on the content. Whereas in the in the middle of the of the tutorial, where the emphasis was on, on teaching the language, it switched totally. The, the switch was to teaching to the whiteboard. These are the language items I want to um, to teach them. And there was a little on, on the social side as well. A low level steady um, checking of techno uh, technological problems, of the technical problems, is everything okay with connectivity uh, or the um, or, or the indicators still there for, for people being connected, are the names still visible and, and so on. Now look at the, at the graph for the inexperienced teacher. The main focus throughout the whole tutorial was on technical issues. It was on the, the panic that something doesn't work. Also the checking, where do I need to click if I want to move the screen forward, if I want to change the whiteboard and so on. So there were lots of uh, technical issues that distract her from focusing on the two important things in the classroom, the language and the social connection. So everything in green is above uh, the, the content and the social. There's still attention to the social. Of course, she greets her students. Of course, she does all the, the necessary social checking and um, talking to them. But there's, there's just not enough time to spend um, on social and content if you're so preoccupied with technical issues. So there is a, there is a difference in both of these different perspectives in online teaching. This study uh, um, has been written up together with my colleagues Li Xingxi and Maya Lloyd as well, and it's been published in Language Learning in Higher Education. So you can read more about those, actually three different teachers there. Now, um, the next section of the talk will be about the learning side, about what students do. Well, we hope it's learning, but <laughs> is it actually? That's one of the questions even the experienced teacher asked us. Um, I do all this direction of attention. I do all this showing what students should be uh, paying attention to, what they should learn. But what do students actually look at? What do they learn? Um, and to answer that, well, we had to do another eye tracking study. Do the, the students actually follow the teacher's direction when she is trying to direct their, their attention to a particular item of, um, of language or to a particular part of the screen. So we set up another eye tracking study where we separated the, the teacher and the, the students. They, had, they were in two different rooms. Um, and we followed the eyes of the, of the student and the eyes of the, of the teacher. And in, this, in these four slides, you can see on the top, you can see a very short uh, clip where the teacher is giving instructions for, it, for a task. It's a language learning task. Um, the typical thing, teach some phrases and then later ask the student to practice them in different sentences with different words, so substitution and so on. But first of all, the 30 seconds at the top are the instructions the teacher gives. And you can see that um, this is a very experienced teacher again. She's blanked off part of the whiteboard uh, where she doesn't want the student to get distracted with all the other words that they're later using in context. She just focuses the attention on those on, on the little square at the top where she's teaching the new words and the new words were some German words gerne, sehr gerne, nicht gerne and so on. So she's teaching them like and, and don't like. Um, and you can, well, to, to tell the, the, the so, uh, long story short, you can tell directly that the student was following the teacher's instructions straight away. The student was looking at the points that the teacher directed the attention to. They could have been looking all over the place. They could have been searching for something else on the screen, but they were following exactly where the teacher was directing the attention. In the second part where the, where the student was actually interacting with other students, using some of the examples, speaking, using the phrases, the newly learned phrases, to put them in context and form new sentences. The student is using the whole of the screen 
So he is using what a teacher has taught him just before these new phrases and how to implement them into whole sentences. So it's using the instructions, but also the new phrases. The teacher doesn't need the instructions anymore. She knows the phrases. So she doesn't focus on, on these phrases. She checks that the students have used all the new words, the new context, the sentences, the substitutions. And she's also checking very much in the participant window that everyone has had the say and so on. So you can see that teaching works online. This is just a tiny little experiment to prove to the teacher who might have felt um, slightly uneasy about whether her, her clever instructions work, that, um, that, that it had worked, that it had worked for her in this case. Now, of course, we, we're making assumptions about learning. And this is another little task for you. And while you are giving me your answers on the Padlet again, the same Padlet as before, about what is language learning, I'll take the time to have a little sip of tea and rest my voice. So I leave you to it. And I'll just watch on my other screen what types of answers you give me to the question, what is language learning? So what is learning, particularly what is language learning? Excellent. Now, in addition to letting me rest a little bit and uh, drink a sip of tea, it's also really interesting for me to see you interacting on, on the Padlet and see the, the texts and the, and the statements evolving. You can see each other's statements as well, so I don't have to read them out, but, but just really interesting um, comments about the, the basic skill is acquiring words, new words, and making making meaning, making sentences, active process of discovery. So there's lots more to it. It's not just the basic skill. It's, it's a lot more discovery learning as well. And language learning can be lots of, of different things. Keep writing, I don't mind, but I'll, I'll carry on with the next slide now and give you a, a brief, so just a, a couple of thoughts about the difference between learning or teaching languages and other forms of teaching. In other subject areas, you think you might get away still with lecturing. Um, this antiquated idea of transmission of knowledge. So the teacher is the one who knows. And by just talking about it and passing this knowledge out through their mouth into the brains of, of the students, you can transmit this knowledge from one person to another. <laughs> it's an idea doesn't necessarily work anymore certainly doesn't work for language learning we know that um, but so, so the slightly more up-to-date um, forms of teaching use the dialogic form of, of um, teaching where the teacher works with input works with directing attention to a particular question or a subject area but then also with questioning and guiding and leading students to dialogues either with the teacher or um, with their peers 
So knowledge is constructed jointly between the learners themselves, but also with some scaffolding, some help from, from the teacher. Now, language learning, of course, has elements of both. It uses practice, but also knowledge. As, as you mentioned in the, in the Padlet, the basic knowledge, the basic learning for, for languages is vocabulary. You need to, to get some words to, to be able to learn more about the, the language and to be able to have a dialogue in the, in the language. Um, and for teachers, for language teachers, the added problem, the difficulty is if you're using dialogic teaching, you have to work with dialogue in L1 and L2. You have to work between two languages. You have to understand that people, when they're constructing a dialogue in the language they're learning, are transporting a lot of, a, a lot of structure, a lot of background knowledge from the first language as well. So in brief, and this, this is not evaluating, this is just looking at the, um, taking a much more practical perspective on the difference between language learning, the, the, the goals, um, language learning and other types of learning. The goals in language learning, as you've, many of you have written in, in the Padlet, is communication, is dialogue, is also listening and reacting, is attention to others. So in some cases, you have to teach how to pay attention to others. It is in the end forming an appropriate reaction, whatever that reaction is, but having an appropriate reaction, uh, an appropriate re response to a statement or to a situation. And ideally arriving at joint understanding. The methods might be different. The methods might imply things like um, you used from other forms of teaching like memory training, drills, role plays, directing attention to differences by pointing out mistakes, for example, or listening training. So more in the training side, that's the methods, but the goals are, the, are definitely more towards the communication side. Now, just to exemplify the differences in learning that students do, again, with a little eye tracking experiment we did. These are different learning situations for, for students. On the left hand side, this is a static reading text. So the, um, the teacher set up this screen. This is an online tutorial, but the task for the student is just read this text and um, respond, answer the comprehension questions below. So the text above is the main focus. As you can see the red dots or the, the red areas and the, uh, the yellow areas and the text above. There's a, a bit of attention on the questions, of course, so in order to, to answer the comprehension questions, you need to understand the text and then also know what the question is, of course. Now let's switch to the second task on the right hand side on the right screen. This is an interactive speaking task. And again, the teacher has prepared the slides, has prepared the words, the, the phrases that the student can use to ask for, for direction or to respond to, to the question. And the student is looking at these phrases. There are some red dots there, but they're also looking in the left-hand window. And your guess um, of what, what's going on here, probably you know it already. This is the interaction with other students in the room. So this is an interactive speaking task. There are a, a number of different students in the tutorial and the student doesn't only just pay attention to the language the teacher wants to teach, but also to the other people they're speaking to. And even if there's no video screen, like here, for example, when I can look at faces or names, or, um, like all lovely sunflowers, for, for example, there is the student's attention definitely drawn to anything that indicates another person in the room. In this case, it's the name. So the student's attention switches very much to the names of other students. As soon as somebody talks, um, the microphone is active, the, uh, the name gets broadened or the, the video appears, whatever indicates there's somebody else speaking, the attention switches to an indication of another person. So students do make, uh, definitely do make a difference between the interactive tasks and uh, the static task. They focus on uh, the text or they focus on the person, whatever the the, the um, goal is for the teaching. 
Oh, just very briefly before we get to the, the online teaching and the challenges of online teaching as well. Um, there's a few theories that have more online potential, I, I would say, than other theories. And, and one of them that I've mentioned before and I like to mention here is constructivism. It's creating meaning through uh, negotiation, but it's also creating meaning through trial and error. So it's uh, inviting students to learn together, together with others, and maybe together with slightly more advanced peers or with a teacher who can help, can scaffold a little bit. But it is not, uh, it's an encouraging errors, it's encouraging risk taking in a language classroom because there is no absolute truth. Your language might be as good as mine, your creativity in using English might be as good as mine and, and so on. Ecological theory, um, also pays attention to the environment. So maybe not just what you can see on the screen. Um, most of the time when we talk about online teaching, we assume that the square of the screen that we see in front of us, that we share with our students, is the limit of their attention. That's not true because they could use, like I'm using a, a paper print copy of some of the slides where I've scribbled notes on, they could be using um, a paper-based dictionary, they could be using a friend behind them who helps them sometimes, or whatever else they, they might be using, tools to learn, but also distractions and, and so on. So there is an environment that interacts with this learning environment. And dynamic systems theory is a specific way of looking at, at this, uh, of the ecology of, of the environment. It's uh, cr by creating balances in attractor states. In other words, by directing the attention to certain features of the language and distracting it from other features, uh, the teacher creates a learning moment or a teaching moment, whatever you, you want to call it. And possibly pushes the, the learner's language a little bit further ahead, which changes other elements of, this, of the learning teaching relationship. For example, if you teach students uh, lots of vocabulary about a certain subject area, you give them the tools to then ask more complicated questions. So they, they will want to ask questions that are just beyond the reach uh, grammatically and they will ask you for grammatical help as well then. So by changing one element in the teaching learning relationship, you influence other elements as well. That's the dynamic systems. Every little change has follow on changes somewhere else. Okay, it's a few names you can associate with these uh, theories. But as I said, I want to move on now to online language teaching and some particular challenges of online language teaching as well. Remember the teaching as directing attention. Remember the, the problem we had saying, well, if you point, how do I know what you're pointing at? And, and so on. So there, there's one, um, one particular challenge already. And as one of the, the teachers, expressed it, if I am teaching, how do I know that the students are learning? And this image came, came to mind. This is one of, of the images I found on the internet that I found really uh, quite telling. And sometimes when doing a webinar, if I haven't got the friendly face of Cesar there, uh, who sometimes looks at, looks at me and, and tells me that he's listening, or if I don't use tricky tools like the Padlet or the Tricider or the text chat. I might well think that I am teaching into the void, that nobody's actually listening, that, that uh, this is just me and the computer interacting, but there isn't really a, a dialogue going on. So this, this dialogic teaching relies very much on the trust from the side of the teacher, that you will be listening, you will be interacting, you will be taking in what I'm talking about, but also paying attention to if I point at a certain image or use a certain image to direct your attention. Okay, and I can see that some comments in the text chat, which I might have used. Yeah. <laughs> okay, some students multitask, yes, we know that. And they, they do maybe not just looking at dictionaries and task related things, they might do knitting or 
preparing the children's meals or whatever at the same time. Yeah, there's other things going on, we know, aside from the screen that, that we are focusing on. It's quite aside from the screen that we can be controlling if we are teachers. Can't be, don't have to. So this is another challenge for teachers. And I noticed during the pandemic, the, there was uh, the first lockdown, particularly in, in the UK or in Europe generally, there was this flurry of emails and questions. And oh, there's so many tools out there. What do I use? What can I use? What am I allowed to use? What's good for the students? If I teach young kids, what, what can I use? And every day there was a new tool mentioned or uh, somebody tweeted about, oh, this is the, the best thing since sliced bread. There's uh, something really great. But there are very rarely any specific reviews where teachers talk about how they're using tools and tell you exactly uh, the benefits and the, the drawbacks of, of different tools. So here's a, um, a list of 10 tool types for language teaching that, um, that the English teachers during a, a webinar we ran in, in March uh, 2020 for teachers who were suddenly forced to move from face-to-face -face teaching, from classroom teaching to online teaching. Um, they responded to the question, well, what tools do you need? Well, what type of tools do you need? They responded very quickly and the top 10 tools for the English teachers were Quizmaker, so things like Mentimeter or Socrative, Games apps, audio recording, editing, sharing, question answer management, like the Tricider, for example, file sharing, file syncing, um, crossword puzzle creator, story creation, video conferencing, video recording, editing, sharing, and course management. So some of the tools you can, can see that the, the schools will have asked for that, things like course management or Moodle, the schools will have decided, okay, you need to control how often does your student go online, how often do they work. But other, other things are um, designed to make students, to keep students entertained, things like the games, maybe the quizzes, the crosswords, and, and so on but also to keep the human element alive in the, in the teaching, the audio recording, the audio sharing, the video conferencing, for example. So lots of different tools that teachers, things that teachers might miss in, in the, um, from teaching face-to-face -face as soon as they move um, online. So there's a little bit of, um, of an idea of, of what you might use and also So a little bit of help in how you can find appropriate tools. And this probably needs a bit of explaining. This is a project I've been working on with uh, colleagues and with the help of the European Centre for Modern Languages, which is based in, in Graz in Austria. And they um, organise uh, sessions, they organise training, they, they did organise the webinar for, for the English teachers in, in spring as well. And we've been working with them for years now to create this inventory of ICT tools. All the tools in this list, in this inventory, were suggested by language teachers, by teachers who actually use them, and they've been rated by, by teachers. They are filtered through different uh, ways. You can either select the skill you want to, to use for, you, you select, um, I need a tool for listening or for speaking, I need a, uh, a, a grammar drill and you can also uh, select the type of interaction so group work pair work and, and so on and you can look for different tool descriptions if you know you want mind mapping you click mind mapping and you get a list of mind mapping tools with descriptions with mini training um, links you can find out quickly whether it's usable whether it's user friendly and all the tools in this inventory, they are for free. So there, there are at least free versions for teachers or for educational purposes. And as, as I said, this, this is something that the European Center for Modern Languages has been working on um, and with, with the help of our team, the ICT REF team. This is free to use if you go to the website ecml.at and just uh, search for the inventory of online tools, you will find the this inventory and you can use that. Yeah. <laughs> Mentimeter, VoiceThread, Kahoot. Yep, yeah, there are lots of 
lots of different tools and it's extremely valuable if you can share with colleagues the benefits and, and also the, the drawbacks of, of certain tools. It helps you select tools, it saves you hours and hours of searching through the internet um, for, for the best tool. So if you've got colleagues you can exchange uh, views with, that's, that's the best thing to do, that, that helps. And if you are really stuck, you can go to the inventory and check through and select um, uh, regarding to certain criteria that you've, you've chosen, what kind of tools you're, tool you're looking for. There's also an attempt by, by Li Xing, uh, she and, and myself, to categorize tools and categorize them in a way that, that teachers would look at them. For example, what, what is the dominance of technology? Do I really want to spend hours training myself to, to use this tool? Will the students find it strange or is it something they use every day, like Skype or video? Um, and also how authentic is it? As you mentioned in the Padlet, at the beginning, there will be more of, of a vocabulary learning of memory and drill, but the more advanced students get, the more authentic you want the communication to be. So do you really need to set up some complicated uh, voice recognition, um, speech recognition software or pronunciation drill, if you could do a, a tandem exchange, for example. So these are different tools that we try to categorize according to these um, criteria. And of course, upskilling. If you want to move your, your language teaching from predominantly face-to-face -to, -face to online, it will need a, some upskilling. Now, I don't think that language teachers have to become technology experts. There's, there's support for this. For, for, for this um, demand, but there's also some resistance that people say, well, actually, I don't want to become uh, a computer teacher. I don't want to become an ICT teacher. I'm happy being a language teacher. Just give me the tools and I use them. But of course, you have to adapt to, to the moving times. And as, as learning is now a lifelong process, everybody, not just teachers, have to learn to live with new technology. Um, but maybe also learn a little bit more to be able to choose the technology for the, for the purpose, make an informed selection rather than just taking what, uh, what the school tells you or what, what your uh, colleague tells you is the best to use. Now, this, this process of upskilling that has been going on for, for years and years, and together with Regina Hampel, we designed this pyramid of online teaching skills way back in, in 2005 when we observed and interviewed um, language teachers at the Open University. And we moved, well, we, we selected these different levels of the pyramid, these different steps in, in the pyramid, not as a linear process. So you don't have to go from basic to all, all the steps up, up to the top, but sort of as um, an illustration of how much more easy it is to facilitate communicative competence once you're really settled on the basic ICT competence, the specific technical competence for the software, when you can decide between the constraints and possibilities of the medium, as we talked before, the difference view, not the uh, efficiency view. So the more, the higher up you get, the easier it is if you've got a solid uh, foundation in the lower levels of the pyramid. And of course, the, the the goal is to use your own teaching style, not, not to be constrained by technology, not be driven by technology, um, but use your own style and your creativity to make your te the teaching your own in an online environment. We've since updated this, um, this pyramid because in 2015, we, we were just assuming that basic ICT competence is not the question anymore. Everybody uses a computer, you use basic things like uh, email or, or Skype. Um, you can do text chats and, and forum entries. So basic ICT competence is, is basically level zero. You, you know that you can assume that from every teacher now, it is every language teacher. But the other levels are still there and it's still easier to be creative and choose the tasks, choose the tools when you're solid on the, on the lower levels of, of the pyramid. An additional um, sideway bar has been added here because 
uh, ICT has uh, and some of the of the digital tools have become so normalized that they are in everyday use. So it has become necessary to negotiate teaching space specifically if you say you want your students to use Facebook, for example, most students will have a private Facebook account. So you need to negotiate your section of, of the, the Facebook task as a teaching space. This is not your private use now. You're doing a task on Facebook, but that doesn't mean that you just go and check your, your wall or whatever. So negotiating teaching spaces has become a necessity as well nowadays. Now, let me move on, and for that I need to do some more preparation here, let me move on to the next challenge for online teaching. Okay, and I hope you weren't all checking your internet connection now, because this was my eight seconds of online silence. Online silence has, has been a, a particular interest of, of mine for research purposes, but also it is a particular challenge for, for teachers. Online silences can look and feel really, really long. I'm not sure whether this video clip will, will play, but let's just see that's another eye tracking video where a heat map is developing over the, the time of very short time of four seconds. Okay, so that, that's the heat map developing while a teacher is waiting for the students to do something, to say something. The teacher is asking a question and is waiting. And even four seconds can feel awfully long. You ex just experienced the eight seconds of, of uh, silence I played with you. I did show you a screen so you knew, and I, I did introduce it as here's something new, something is coming. But eight seconds can feel like a very, very long time if there's no announcement, if there's no, wait, there's something coming beforehand. And in this case, the teacher did ask the question, and, and when we then uh, talked about it, it was actually um, a user error. One of the typical things, forgot to press the microphone button. So she was talking to the screen, but the students couldn't hear her. So nobody could hear the question she was asking, but she was waiting for the answers and then had to check, first checking the, that the screen was right, that the question was really the right one to ask, that it wasn't too difficult, and then check um, that the, the uh, participants window to see the participants were still there, the connection was, was there. And finally she checked down at the bottom, she checked the microphone and could see that her microphone button wasn't highlighted. So she wasn't actually speaking to the students, just speaking to herself in her room as one does. <laughs> okay, now there are different types of silences, of course, in online tutorials and some are more and some are less frightening. Some silences are really purposeful, and even in face-to-face in -face teaching, you use silences sometimes. Following an instruction, you would stay silent for a bit to allow students to ask a question or even to do the task. So whatever, if you say, I give you five minutes to read this text and then immediately start talking, you're not allowing the students to do the task. So following instructions, there's a purposeful uh, silence and sometimes an announced silence. So the teacher says explicitly, this is what the time I give you now. There's also silence for the confirmation check that uh, students have understood what, what the task is, comprehension checks and so on. There's also in addition online, sometimes the announced changes. I, if, a, if a tutor says, give me a second now, I need to change between screens or give me a minute, I'm just uploading. Um, something like that. There's also the purposeful silence if the teacher purposefully uses a different mode, for example, the text chat, confirming while, while the students are still reading, preparing a, a text entry, or um, while she's thinking the student might prepare an answer, might, might be thinking about the answer, maybe helping a little bit with vocabulary in the text chat, but rather than speaking and interrupting, using the text chat using a different mode. 
but there's also um, the very didactic uh, purpose for silence is encouraging the student to self-correct. So as, as a teacher, you ask a question, you get an answer, it's almost there, but not quite. So you give a little bit of silence to encourage the student to repeat, but with a better version. There's also the unexpected silences, of course, which are a little bit more frightening for, for a teacher online. The turn taking, um, but also the politeness. Some, sometimes students don't want to say anything until the teacher says you and points the finger or, or asks the name um, to follow the, with the next statement. And there's also the, the politeness of, of uh, just pragmatic politeness in different cultures, in, in different ways. Uh, expressed for how long you will be silent after a person of authority has spoken, for example. And then there are the technical silences. The, again, purposeful but technical silence in the farewells where the teacher waits silently for students to leave, you wouldn't hear much of, of um, a sound. The operational error, as I said before, the little video clip I showed, the teacher forgot to press the microphone button. It happens to everyone happens to the students very often as well. And then you've got real connection problems or audio problems. You're using a microphone, the microphone fails or doesn't work. Or you, you've got, like me at the beginning, you've got permissions, but not at the right uh, level. So you need to go out and go in again. Technical errors, connection problems, always happens. So to illustrate this, here the silences from the teacher perspective and then I will show you the silences from the student perspective as well. They're overlapping but they're not exactly the same. So the teacher has these filled silences where she's doing something, preparing something, the planned silences where she gives the student uh, space or time to do something, the didactic silence where she so, sort of waits with bated breath for the student to self-correct and there's also the, the language silences where She's not quite sure whether the, the student's level is good enough for the, for the language she's asking and so on, or the silence that the language dictates to keep a bit of a pause here or there. Then there's the student perspective and the addition to the teacher's silences, there's also, of course, the technical silences, there's the confusion, um, a silence of confusion. Am I supposed to do something now? Did she ask me? Did she ask somebody else? There's the very necessary thinking pause, and this thinking pause is where actual learning takes place. So this, this is a pause that's necessary for the students to be able to digest everything. And the language pause where the student takes just a bit longer for every word than a native speaker would. So there's silences, pauses in between as well. And then there's the emotional silences, that uh, silence of shyness where I'd rather not say anything. And sometimes this is accompanied by a text chat message. Sorry, my microphone doesn't work. It could be the microphone doesn't work. It could be the student doesn't want to speak. As I said, there is some overlap in, in the silences. Some of these silences overlap and some can't be explained and some can be prepared for and others can't. So there are some emotional silences like reticent, shyness, also panic that suddenly I realize that oh, this, this is a vocabulary area I haven't prepared for. I don't know how to say this, or my pronunciation is so bad, the teacher didn't understand me twice. Now I don't dare to say it a third, third time. So there's uh, some uh, silences that can be overcome, and some silences we just have to work with, or we want to work with, like the giving room for answers, the didactic silences we want to use uh, specifically. So before I come to the, the last section, the practical tips, this is just the writing up of the silence as a challenge, how online language teachers deal with the void, the, the silences in, in the online classroom. Now my practical tips are in four particular areas. And I can summarize them in very short words, be explicit, allow silences, choose your tech wisely and learn, learn, learn. So these are your, your takeaways from this webinar if, if you want to get more into online language teaching or also if you want to look for research questions for, for online learning, learning teaching, um, online language teaching. Um, the first practical tip, be explicit. Say what your frame of reference is. 
So not not just say I'm going to be silent now, or I'm I'm going to switch my my whiteboard now, or I'm doing this or that, but also be explicit which frame of reference you're using. Are you teaching rules now? Are the students to believe you because you're referring to the authority of proper English or accepted grammar or accepted usage? So is this rules that they just have to take in and accept? Or are you making conversation? Are you starting a dialogue? Are the students expected to join in, to say something in response or to start their own dialogue with their peers? Or are you encouraging the construction of knowledge? Are you inviting mistakes? Are you hoping that the students will learn by making mistakes, by being creative, by being brave and courageous? So this is the being explicit, the part of being explicit that links back to the ways of knowing we, we discussed at the, right at the beginning. Pra practical tip number two, allow silences because the silences might be the space for learning. And here are a few statements from, uh, from teachers who've talked about, reflected on, on their online teaching. Um, first, it's always the technology. The first obstacle is always the technology, of course. That's, that's one of the things that, um, that you find that technology might be the reason, but it's not always. It's interesting, this is silence. The students can't see anything, but actually there's so many things happening right now. So the teacher is busy, the students are busy, things are happening even if you can't record it or can't hear anything at the moment. Um, but also this, this one teacher's reflection on how she tries to avoid silences. I have lots and lots of activities, another strategy, lots of activities so students don't even have to minute to go into their emails, I have lots of activities reflecting that this doesn't allow, this pushing, 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 doesn't allow the space for silence and maybe doesn't allow the space for learning either. So keeping the learning time in, in mind when you are designing online teaching. Practically tip number three, that's choose your tech wisely. Technology shouldn't be driving uh, the, the pedagogy, shouldn't be driving the teaching. Ideally, you choose your pedagogical approach first, then you choose an appropriate technology. So you need to know a little bit about the different technologies, different tools you can use, choosing the appropriate technology, applying it in your own practice, reflecting on how successful this has been, or maybe unsuccessful, maybe it wasn't the right tool, maybe the students hate it, and then choosing again, but making this choice reflective and cyclical. So you, you're never done choosing, you're never done preparing the ideal class. It's an iterative process. And as I said, learn, learn, learn. The more you learn about online um, teaching and online language learning, the more questions you will have. And you can do action research types, you can do observations, you can do experiments, you can do eye tracking, you can do interviews, you can create your own um, frameworks that help you explain what's going on in online teaching but don't ever stop learning because technology moves on, learning moves on, and uh, even language moves on as well. And now let me come to the, the close of my argument and the question why online language teachers need epistemology, because learning a new language is a decentering experience. It is. It means for the learner that they have to cope with ambiguity, with not knowing, not knowing, uh, not being certain, having their own worldview slightly imbalanced, slightly um, off skelter. It also means losing your mental balance a bit for the learner and to help them through that process. As a language teacher, you need to be a guide into this new worldview. However different or however similar the languages are, you have to teach them that you have to let go a little bit, you have to lose your balance a little bit to then be able to in, enjoy the new worldview and the new things that you find, the new mindsets. Okay, that's it from me and I hope you've got some questions as well. We can answer, can answer them together. I just want to say um, thank you very much, Dr. Stickler, for um, your very fascinating presentation. It, 
it's just been wonderful. It gave us all a lot to think about, and I appreciated your practical tips at the end as well. Um, I realize that we've run out of time, so if folks did want to sign off, that that's okay. We understand people have things to do, but um, perhaps if Ursula wanted, she can stay on a couple of minutes if people do have questions. But um, but I just thought we'd take this opportunity right now to to clap our hands virtually and say thank you very much. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. You're very welcome. And of course, I stay longer because I, I had these technical issues at the beginning. So that's another thing to take into account. Always allow for a little bit more time. Well, that's wonderful. So folks could either ask questions in the chat room or they can just do it orally. Of course, I can see Dr. Stickler's um, email address there is, is there as well. So. Um, yeah, I think now we're going to stop the recording as well. Yes, okay.